Hello, my name is John Keown, and I'm a professor in the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown. And I'm speaking to you today in a personal capacity on voluntary euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide, the two slippery slope arguments against legalization. People disagree about whether it's ever ethical in principle for a physician to administer a lethal injection to a competent patient who requests it to put an end to their suffering, that is voluntary euthanasia or BE. They disagree also about whether it's ever ethical for a physician to assist a patient to end their life by prescribing a lethal drug, that is physician-assisted suicide or PAS. Professional medical ethics and the criminal law have traditionally held that it's always wrong for a physician intentionally to kill a patient or assist a patient in suicide. As the House of Lords Select Committee on Medical Ethics aptly put it in 1994, the legal prohibition on intentional killing is the cornerstone of law and of social relationships that protects each one of us impartially, embodying the belief that all are equal. But some people think that the lives of some patients are no longer worth living, perhaps because of pain, suffering or disability, that they would therefore be better off dead and that physicians ought morally to grant their request for hasten death. However, even many people who think that VE and PAS are in principle ethical in hard cases, nevertheless oppose their legalization. They do so because they consider that legalization would result in the extension of the practices to cases that are clearly objectionable, such as the administration of lethal injections to incompetent patients, that is non-voluntary euthanasia or NVE. In short, they judge, legalization would propel society down a dangerous slippery slope. The slippery slope arguments against legalization comprises two independence arguments the logical and the empirical. We'll focus on these two arguments as they apply against the legalization of VE, though we'll also mention their force against the legalization of PAS. Firstly then, the logical slippery slope argument against legalization. The logical argument against legalizing VE is that <clears throat> even if precise guidelines could be framed and enforced, so as to permit VE only in the sort of hard cases on which euthanasia campaigners and the media focus, where it's freely requested by competent patients in cases of terminal illness. The moral case for euthanasia with those limitations is also logically a case for euthanasia without them. If euthanasia is justified to end the suffering of a competent patient, why not of an incompetent patient? If euthanasia is justified to end the suffering of the terminally ill, why not of those with chronic illness, whether physical or mental? Let's consider first the logical link between VE and NVE. Acceptance of VE requires acceptance of NVE because the former rests fundamentally on the judgment that patients who merit VE would be better off dead, which judgment can logically be made even if the patients such as an infant or a person with advanced dementia, is incapable of making an autonomous request for death. The proposals typically advanced by advocates of VE and PAS have long envisaged a central role for the doctor, not only in the termination of life itself, but also in the decision to terminate life. They're not proposals for euthanasia on demand, simply at the patient's request and without the considered judgment and approval of a responsible doctor. In other words, the case for VE made by its own proponents rests not only on respect for patients' autonomous requests, but also on the principle of beneficence. A doctor is thought to be justified in ending the patient's life because in certain circumstances, like terminal illness, death is thought to be a benefit to the patient, a benefit it's the doctor's duty to confer. Doctors are not robots who mindlessly comply with their patient's wishes whether for antibiotics or surgery. They are professionals who form their own judgment about the merits of any request for medical intervention. 
A responsible doctor would no more agree to kill a patient merely because the patient asked for it than the doctor would prescribe antibiotics or amputate limbs. The doctor, if acting professionally, would decide in each case whether the intervention would truly benefit the patient. Whether in the case of a request for euthanasia, the patient would, in the doctor's judgment, be better off dead. Consequently, the underlying rather than the superficial justification for VE is not so much the patient's request as the doctor's judgment that the request should be granted because death would benefit the patient. True, in the proposals advanced by VE campaigners, this judgment would not be made without a request by the patient. But even under such proposals, the request is not decisive. The request triggers the doctor's judgment about the merits of the request. The doctor decides whether or not the patient would be better off dead. The patient proposes, but the doctor disposes. And if a doctor can make this judgment in relation to an autonomous patient, a doctor can logically make it in relation to an incompetent patient. To put it another way, <clears throat> VE is said to be justified by respect for patient autonomy and by the duty of beneficence. But the absence of autonomy does not cancel the duty of beneficence. The doctor who performs VE may claim it's justified by respect for autonomy and by the duty of beneficence. The doctor who performs NVE cannot rely on respect for autonomy, but can invoke the duty of beneficence. If euthanasia were to be made available to suffering competent people who requested it, why would it not be unjustly discriminatory to deny the benefit of a hastened death to those who were suffering but incompetent to request it? Most, and very possibly all, of the leading philosophers who advocate VE also, quite logically, endorse NVE. Logic also questions two other limitations common to proposals for legalization. The limitation of VE or PAS to terminal illness and the limitation to PAS. Let's look at the first limitation to terminal illness. The argument for VE or PAS for the terminally ill and it's typically couched in terms of the doctor's duty of beneficence, the duty to alleviate the patient's suffering. Why is it, is it asked, should the terminally ill be allowed to suffer when there is the alternative of a hastened death? However, if it's ethical to end the life of a terminally ill patient to end their suffering, it's also ethical to end the life of a chronically ill patient to end their suffering. Indeed, the argument for intervention is even stronger because the person with the chronic illness has longer to suffer and may be suffering more gravely than the terminally ill patient. What about the second limitation to physician-assisted suicide? Proposals for legalization in the US and the UK are typically limited to physician-assisted suicide. But it makes no more moral sense to limit a hastened death to this method than it does to limit it to the competence and to the terminally ill. If the moral justification for PAS is respect for the autonomy of those who request it and the physician's duty to alleviate suffering, those arguments equally justify VE. Moreover, what if a patient is physically unable to end their own life, even if a physician provides them with a prescription for a lethal drug, perhaps because the patient is totally paralyzed? Why should that patient be denied the benefit of AIDS and death? Is that not unjust discrimination against those who are paralyzed? What if the patient is old and frail and fears botching their own suicide and would much prefer the physician to administer a lethal injection? Why should their preference be denied? Jurisdictions beyond the US that relax their laws, such as Canada and the Netherlands, appreciate that allowing only PAS is morally unjustifiable. Why then, given that these limitations to competent patients, terminal illness and PAS make little moral sense, do we find them in proposals for reform in the US and the UK? Well, one obvious answer has more to do with politics than ethics. It's more feasible to garner popular and legislative support for proposals that are limited in such ways 
those limitations may serve to assuage some people's fears about a likely descent down a slippery slope. Let's turn now to the empirical slippery slope argument against legalization. The empirical argument is distinct from the logical argument, but complements it. It holds that even if a line could be drawn in principle between V and hard cases and less hard cases, a slide will inevitably, or at least very likely occur in practice because the safeguards to prevent it cannot be made effective. Even as a purely practical or empirical matter, therefore, VE resists effective legal regulation. Any attempt at effective regulation will be frustrated because of the difficulty, if not impossibility, of drafting precise guidelines and of then policing them. What precisely is meant by a voluntary and informed request for a lethal injection? What's meant by unbearable suffering or terminal illness? Even if precise guidelines could be drafted, how could they be enforced? Laws enacted hitherto, such as those in the Netherlands and Oregon, rely largely on self-reporting by physicians after the event. As one leading euthanasia advocate has admitted, this is like enforcing the speed limit by relying on drivers to report their own infractions. And as a backdrop, we should bear in mind the manifold failings in modern healthcare, even in developed countries, where problems of funding and staffing levels often result in overstressed or overtired professionals having to meet unforgiving targets and overstretched budgets. Doctors and nurses often have far too little time to attend adequately to their patients' needs. And there are grave and growing problems in the provision of adequate social care. The crisis in health and social care seems likely to be aggravated by increasing costs and the growing number of elderly. The pandemic has served to highlight the grave inadequacies in social and medical care of the elderly and disabled. Why would these very real pressures not influence patients' decisions to request VE or PAS, as well as the quality of the assessment of such requests? Why would deficiencies, which currently affect, say, the assessment of patients' palliative care or mental health needs, not also affect assessments for VE or PAS? And many applicants would have unmet palliative care and mental health needs. The empirical slippery slope notes three particular concerns which overlap capacity depression and vulnerability there are serious questions about the definition of legal capacity and serious disagreement about how to assess legal capacity there are major concerns about how many patients who would request so-called assisted dying would actually be suffering from depression there's evidence that many patients whose depression is adequately treated then change their mind about wanting to hasten death. And vulnerability. Many patients would surely be vulnerable, as the eminent philosopher Honora O'Neill has written. Legalizing assisted dying places a huge burden on the vulnerable, let alone the vulnerable and depressed. Laws are written for all of us, she says, in all situations, not just for the unusually independent. Legislation would surely have profound socio-cultural consequences, aggravating vulnerabilities. As one scholar has put it, relatives and friends may come to see physician-assisted suicide not only as an acceptable, but as a preferred or praiseworthy form of death. And she writes, strong social expectations are likely to develop for individuals to choose assisted suicide as soon as their physical capacities decline to a point where they become extremely dependent upon others in an expensive, inconvenient way. If PAS were available, why should people not be expected to do the decent thing and access it? 
particularly to save resources for their families and the health service. Could all these concerns not be met by so-called strict safeguards? Well, there's little reason to believe so. It's often claimed that the laws in the Netherlands and Oregon are examples of laws that have worked well and prevented mistake and abuse. <clears throat> but such claims are unpersuasive. Further, Dr. Neil Gorsuch, now Justice Gorsuch of the Supreme Court, noted in his excellent book, The Future of Assisted Suicide and Euthanasia, that there are many unanswered questions about the Oregon experience, such as the extent to which alternative options, such as treatment for depression, are being presented to patients, and that there's little chance of those questions, questions essential to an assessment of the law, being answered anytime soon, given the many limitations the law places on the Oregon Health Authority. Nor does the relatively sparse data reported by that authority reassure. Recent figures confirm, for example, that for the vast majority of people who seek physician-assisted suicide, the main reasons are not pain and suffering, but losing autonomy and not being able to engage in activities making life enjoyable. For many patients, they've expressed a feeling of being a burden on family, friends, and caregivers. And very, very few have been referred for psychological evaluation. <clears throat> As for the Netherlands, where unlike Oregon, there have been comprehensive official surveys of medical decision-making over several years. Those surveys have shown that since the Supreme Court in the Netherlands declared V and PAS lawful back in 1984, Dutch doctors have, in violation of key safeguards, failed to report thousands of cases to the euthanasia review committees and have given lethal injections to thousands of patients without an explicit request. And referrals to prosecutors of these breaches have been rare, prosecutions rarer still. In short, the guidelines have been consistently and widely flouted in the Netherlands and with virtual impunity. Professor Theo Bohr, a former review committee member, has lamented the rising incidence of VA and PS in his country, as well as the expanding interpretation of the guidelines and the fact that supply has fueled demand. He has noted the normalization of VE and PAS. They are now increasingly seen not as a last resort, but as a normal death. Let's turn now then to our conclusions. The logical and the empirical arguments against permitting VE and or PAS are formidable. The logical argument is unanswerable. The moral case for VE is equally a case for MVE, and the case for PAS for the terminally ill is equally a case for VE and for the chronically ill. The empirical argument has yet to be answered, not least by any jurisdiction that has permitted VE or PAS. Indeed, laws such as those in Oregon and the Netherlands serve to illustrate the force of the argument, not least because those laws rely largely on self-reporting after the fact by physicians themselves. The safeguards in the Oregon law have been described by one of the leading health law experts in America, Professor Alex Capron, as largely illusory. They're incapable of detecting mistake and abuse and claims that the Oregon law is effectively doing so a little more than assertion. And absence of evidence of abuse is not evidence of absence of abuse. Plus the logical extension of laws like those in Oregon involving the removal of its current obstacles to wider access is surely only a matter of time. The Dutch experience illustrates the fourth of both the empirical and the logical arguments. Not only have the guidelines been consistently breached on a wide scale and with virtual impunity, but in 1996, the Dutch courts extended the law to permit NVE in the form of lethal injections for disabled infants. And in 2016, the Dutch government proposed to extend the law 
to allow healthy elderly folk who feel their life is completed to obtain assisted suicide. In short, both the logical and the empirical arguments against legalization are powerful, real, and persuasive. Thank you.